Welcome. I'm glad you ventured out. At least it's not raining, mushy um, Saturday afternoon. I'm Joanne Abel, the Humanities Program Coordinator, and I want to welcome you and thank you for choosing to spend your Saturday afternoon with us today. Um, before we begin, those of you that have been here know I always do a quick commercial for our upcoming humanities programs. If you don't have a brochure, please grab one. We're, the new one for July through uh, September is, at, is almost at the press, so if you don't get it in the mail, please sign up back at the desk, I mean back at the table. Um, this Thursday at the Southwest Regional Branch, George Ann Eubanks will be talking about literary trails of Eastern North Carolina. This is her last in the trilogy that she's done, and this one is a lot of fun. She actually talks a lot about food. I don't know why she didn't do that for the Piedmont one, but um, it's, it's wonderful. She, she will it'll be a, a slide presentation, so it's really like a guidebook of um, places to see connected to authors in the eastern part of North Carolina. Okay. The next Sunday, we're doing something a little different. Here at the main library at 2.30, we're going to have a Klesner band playing, we're going to have a pop-up museum, and the program is called Jews in Durham in Transition. It's sort of a history of the Jewish community in Durham. We're going to have special treats, and we hope that you all will come to that, too. Now, I would like to introduce Alice Sharp, the development officer of the library, and it was her idea to do this amazing series of programs called Bullish on Durham. And she actually knows all of these folks because she's on the board of Central, uh, Durham Central Park. And so the program is really hers, and so she gets to introduce everybody. And let's give her a hand. Thanks for the applause, folks, but I really haven't done anything other than know these four fabulous folks. Um, but before we get in on the program, I do want to call your attention to the reason why we're able to have these humanities programs. And that's because of Durham Library Foundation. Without their support and an underwriting of these series, we wouldn't be having these wonderful programs. And as a plug, I want you to know that Durham Library Foundation is actually in the midst of a $1.5 million campaign to enhance uh, continued library services and the humanities program programs. Uh, we're more than halfway over that hump, which is a really good thing, but we do need uh, public help to get to the finish line. So there's some little brochures there in the back, and if you feel so inclined, please pick up one, find out where the money will be going, and hopefully uh, you will support the campaign to further enhance the wonderful Durham County library system that we have. All right, now to the matter at hand. Um, First of all, I want to read a quote to you, and it's one you've all heard. And if you're feeling in any way a little bit helpless because of all the things that are happening in the world, trust me, when you hear the story of Durham Central Park today, you will go away rejuvenated and knowing I can make a difference. Margaret Mead said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And I don't know of a better quote that explains exactly what happened with Durham Central Park and two friends who happened to take their daily walks together. But I'm getting ahead of myself. That's their story to tell. First of all, we have Dan Jewell, who will serve as our moderator for the panel. And Dan is a landscape architect and co-founder of Coulter Jewell Thames. Thames? Thames. PA. Um, uh, it is a site design firm right here in downtown Durham and has been here for quite some time. He and his firm have designed various places in and around Durham, including Bright Lead Square, the American Tobacco District, Irwin Terrace, and a large role in the creation of Durham Central Park, which you'll hear more about. Um, he and his wife of 35 years, Chris, reside on Gloria Avenue in Trinity Park neighborhood. Trinity Park neighborhood is really a great neighborhood when it comes to doing things that help to enhance our entire community. That wasn't in his bio, that's just my editorial comment. Um, Kurt Eshelman is a retired, a retiring, he keeps retiring. He, he's never put the ED on it, so I don't think he's quite there yet. But he's a retiring family doctor who was part of the beginnings of the park. 
He has lived in Durham for nearly 40 years and was active in support of the schools prior to shifting focus, his focus, to the Central Park neighborhood. Um, his very good friend, who has known him for since medical school, is Alan Wilcox. Alan, raise your hands. <laughs> Alan and Kurt were friends in high school, classmates in medical school, and then moved to Durham in the mid-70s with their families to continue their training at UNC. Alan is an epidemiologist doing his research at the National Institutes of Health in RTP. Kurt is a, re and, and this is a little addition, this is about Kurt. And I have to tell you, when I first met these men, I got them mixed up all the time. <laughs> Uh, why? Why? <laughs> they do, they do look so similar. But both Alan and Kurt have served as president of the board of directors of Durham Central Park. Now I'm going to read the one line that this person sent in, but I'm going to embellish on that as well. Leanne Tilly, I don't think she has to raise her hand. <laughs> Leanne is a Durham Central Park area business owner along with her husband Larry. She and her husband have been active board members for the past 10 years. That was what she sent in. Let me tell you the real story about that. <laughs> Leanne is one of the driving forces behind the fundraising efforts for Durham Central Park. Without Leanne's efforts, the park would not have been able to do so many of the wonderful things um, that they have accomplished. And you may know her through Meals from the Market. She was the genius behind that particular series. And it seems like every nonprofit now is doing a dinner, and it started with Leanne. So now, with that, I will turn it over to Dan. Well, Alice, thank you for the uh, friendly and familiar introduction. It's uh, it's great to be up here among folks that I've counted as close friends for many years, and of course, Alice is on that list as well. Um, uh, thank you for all being out here today. You could all be out in Central Park running around, but I can attest because I was there this morning that it's very soggy right now because of that five inches of rain. And I will also apologize a little bit for myself and Leanne. We're maybe a little more casually dressed than we would normally be for this, but we would like to model the, the brand new t-shirts that uh, we just received last week. Alice is going to run over after this and uh, break into our storage shed and get one for herself. So, but that, and, and that is one of the many things that sustains Central Park. So thank you all for being here. So my job is just to sort of get these folks to talk a little bit and maybe we'll get a little conversational. And uh, if uh, Joanne and Alice at some point can gauge the audience and see when you guys are actually tired of listening to us and we might uh, start answering some questions instead. We're, we're, we're going to roll into that. But, but let's get started. There's, uh, you know, folks have been around for a while and I know you've all been out to the park and the pavilion and events and the, in the, the, the farmer's market, which has become, I think, the social event on, on Saturday mornings in Durham where, where everybody likes to go, or as we call the park, everybody's backyard. But there was a lot of effort and a lot of work that happened before we pulled the first weed or picked up the first piece of asphalt out there that, that started back in the mid-90s. And uh, as Alice said, we're, we're fortunate to, today to have the, the two gentlemen who have been uh, uh, credited, blamed, whatever you want to call it, with being the, the start of really uh, not just the park, but I think what we could say has been the impetus for the uh, the renaissance of the the northern downtown area, or uh, NOCO, as I guess as it's now called, <laughs> the, the name that's been adopted. So we're going to pass the microphone around a little bit. But Kurt, can you maybe tell us what that first spark was when when you and Alan were out trudging around one Saturday? Yeah, I even brought the map. Wow. Uh, oh, good. The, the, uh, Al and I have been friends for a long time, and it w was right at about 20 years ago, uh, uh, sometime in the first half of the 90s, and uh, he and I were just taking a walk, and we often went around Duke campus, but this time we went east, uh, Trinity Park, and ended up in the neighborhood that we now know as Durham Central Park. And Alan had read something um, about new urbanism. I think that community in South Florida 
um, had been publicized and and the concept of people moving back downtown and and things happening back downtown coming back out of suburbia and coming into a a, a walking friendly more congested but more lively kind of place it, he had read something about this so that was we talked about that and we were amazed that this area was uh, so close to downtown and yet nobody nobody there nobody there at all and and so we went back and I drove and th the original of this which I couldn't find uh, and this is why I was like Alan and then we, we drove every block and Alan color-coded what was going on in that space so every weeded lot every parking lot that wasn't under use every vacant building um, up and down every street and we we in fact a little underestimated what there was some going, stuff going on there but the, the neighborhood actually looked certainly on the weekend we were there there was nobody and there was a sense that um, that something should happen here and and so we talked about it but didn't have much to do until some years later and so Alan you want to give your perspective on that it was fine. You did fine. Okay, I did fine. <laughs> it was his idea. That's what did. Um, so, so some years later, um, my wife and I had some good fortune and had some money to give. And two other things happened, I think, in background that are just important to mention in passing. Uh, first, we merged our schools in, in 1992, and, and that was really important because because uh, we had. We, we didn't have the violence that some communities had when we desegregated our schools, but we ended up with the term city schools and the term county schools, and then over about 30 years, as the city grew, it didn't annex into the school system the areas that were annexed. And so you had Durham County schools, and Durham County schools had what was called city out. And in fact, over about 10 to 15 years, as people all over the country moved to the suburbs, but especially here, you ended up with middle class white people, middle class black people, all moving to the new parts of the city that were in the county school system. And the city school system was largely black, over 90% black, and disproportionately housing project uh, uh, dominated. And, and that was just disastrous for this community. It was disastrous for the county. Um, that people, newcomers to this community would hear about all this and then they'd say, whoa, whoa, I'm moving to Cary. And in, and in fact, we, we didn't get the kind of growth. And, and so it, it was a, a, a great bit of leadership by our local leader. So merging the schools, and that happened in 92. Um, uh, the other thing that happened is that a small group of downtown business people started Downtown Durham, Inc. And they hired Bill Kalkoff to be the executive director of that. And he was employed in 93. Um, and uh, and so, so in 94, when I was trying to think what we could do with a hunk of money that would actually move the mark, I took this idea to Bill Kalkoff and said, if we raise the money and we've got seed money in hand, what would we do? And the what we would do was a charrette, and now I am going to hand it over to him. <laughs> I thought my job here was going to be to correct Kurt. But actually, <laughs> I, I pretty much agreed with almost everything he said. <laughs> so I had never heard of a charrette before. And the idea was to bring together people who are designers, who are imaginative uh, designers, architects, landscape architects, and to uh, address a, a kind of physical setting in an imaginative way to say, how could this area be improved? And I'm, part of the reason I'm hesitating here is because there's actually a couple of other pieces uh, that have been skipped over. So <laughs> let, me, let me back off and just say, I'm sitting here thinking, how did this happen? Because, you know, I grew up, I kind of came of age in the 60s, and I thought things were either locked in stone and never changed, or they changed by revolution, right? <laughs> and in fact, 
you know, Alice's quote at the beginning is really great because things really change when people who have relationships with each other work together to make it change. And even now, when I think back on what's happened with Durham Central Park in the last 20 years, it's hard for me to um, really understand how this wonderful thing came out of this original idea. Uh, one of the things that Bill Kalkoff did that Kurt did not mention is he sort of tested the waters by having a meeting with us and people who were movers and shakers in the community. Some bankers, some politicians, um, some developers, and we all met one morning uh, with breakfast and Kurt presented this flaky idea of trying to do something to this part of the city that's been neglected. And everybody said, yeah, that's a good idea, but the bank said, well, we won't loan money unless we feel like it's a secure investment. And the developer said, well, we, we can't build there unless the banks will loan us money. And the politicians said, you know, we're, we're glad to support it if the developers will go in and do something. So it's like everybody was pointing at each other. And in a way, I came away a little discouraged thinking, how are we ever going to create, you know, change the, 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 the image of this part of the city so it starts to look like something desirable? So, uh, Kurt donated the money to pay for this design weekend, and it was preceded by a couple of public meetings. I think one of them might have been in this room, uh, where we asked people, you know, who were in neighboring uh, you know, close by neighborhoods and people who had businesses and just said, you know, what would you think if we, uh, you know, brought some attention to this area and people were kind of, you know, they said, well, it's, that's kind of a dying part of town, but, you know, nobody was arguing that it would be a good idea. So we got to the charrette and there were three teams of architects and landscape architects and some community people and they spent the weekend, I'm, you a, mean, week. a week, a week, okay, yeah. uh, sort of at this intensive planning process, and Kurt may have to correct me on some of this. Uh, at the end of the week, these three teams presented their ideas for how this neighborhood could be completely redesigned, you know, and they were all, you know, they were all, um, you know, fantastic and and way beyond anything that we could imagine doing. But each one of them included the idea of having a park in it. And I think that gave us the notion that how do we start this? There's actually a way to start it. We can see if we can build a park to kind of be the core of a, a, a rejuvenation of this part of, of the city. <coughs> Go from there. Now, actually, Leanne, you should come back. Yeah. Well, all I can add is that uh, I was going to work every day <laughs> at the corner of Deer and Foster <laughs> and going through the drive through at the doghouse, which was our one food amenity. <laughs> Put that in perspective, Leanne, because you're, you're, you've been part of a family business that's been down in that district for right. a long time. So. You know, right. Put it in perspective. What what right. was it like well, as somebody who worked in that neighborhood that Kurt and Allen went went to and said, "Wow, we need some help here," but. You were there every day. What was it like back right. then? Right. Well, you know, it, when I first came in 84, my in-laws had a bath boutique shop on Gear Street. Hannah Fargo Rugs was down. It was more of a retail area where people came and mm -hmm. felt shopped. There was a hardware store and mm -hmm. there were businesses there. Mm -hmm. And then they just started falling off. And um, um, things just started getting really bleak on the trip between my shop and the <laughs> post office. It was like you just... You just went through it and didn't really notice anything anymore. It's, and um, um, so, when we would hire people, they would be afraid to come, you know, come there. And and really, we did. We had troubles. Our vehicles would be vandalized. We couldn't leave our vehicles at the shop. And now, they're there all night, and we could leave the gate unlocked, and we don't have any trouble. So anyway, we've seen a huge difference. Um, and that the sidewalks are there for people to walk on now. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what do you recall, actually, for those maybe who haven't been around for the 12 or 13 years since we actually started building the park? What, what was on the property? What was where the, the pavilion is now? Right. And what was on the other side of the street where we have the, 
the great lawn and the picnic tables and the, the nice bridge mm -hmm. and, 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 and those areas. Well, Durham Hardware was on the corner and then uh, where Ellen Castley is now and then, you know, um, there, when I got involved, the, the, me the metal artists were there because um, uh, Walker Stone had found that his building, that huge building at least could be valuable for storage and for people who were looking for inexpensive space. So there was a little community there of wonderful um, artists. Mm -hmm. And then there was Terry's Transmission and yeah. you know, the creek, you just didn't even know the creek was there. You know, you just wouldn't know. And it was just all covered with weeds and the mimosa trees that we keep whacking at or, you know, they were all over the place. And then there was problems with people sleeping at the, there and, and um, well, Vega Metals came in, you know, I mean, they, they pioneered that little right. corner there right. as people were leaving. The doghouse was across the street where the pavilion is, and um, it was all kind of car-related industries. Tire, tire store. Yeah. Yeah, right, and um, so it was all kind of related to automobiles and kind of greasy kind of shops. <laughs> so, so sort of to put this time frame in perspective, this, you know, this would have been about 1995, which was was right when the Bulls had vacated the old stadium. If you remember, I think the I think the new stadium was supposed to be ready in '93, and it wasn't quite. So they had the uh, encore year mm -hmm. at the uh, at the old DAP. Uh, but by '95, they were gone, mm -hmm. and there was there was nobody down there. So, yeah. so uh, Kurt and Allen, tell us a little bit more about how did the uh, how did how did we end up settling and working toward. The, the first pass at the, the design of the park that we have today. Because you said the one commonality of the three big charrette schemes, and, and I have copies of them all, they, they didn't just, they didn't look at a park. They were looking at the entire neighborhood. And as, as Alan said, there were, some, there were some big ideas, some practical, maybe not, not, not many, but how did we focus on uh, the park being the thing that really needed to be done first to, to drive that train? And I also remember we then went through a series of, uh, of workshops and, and even a design charrette to come up with a design for the park, which eventually led to identifying where we wanted to have it. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, uh, in, in these teams of, uh, uh, the, the urban, the charrette was actually formally called an urban design assistance team that was commissioned from the American Institutes of Architects. It was led by Peter Batchelor who's a professor uh, at North Carolina State. And, and the park was the common, common feature and all of that. The YMCA, that, the land had been set aside for the Thelonious Monk uh, Jazz uh, Institute. And so we advocated for giving that land to the YMCA and, and the Y got a good deal on that in the Child Care Center. And I think that may have been the first thing that was built in but then it was, we focused on the park uh, and finding the area for the park. In 1996, <laughs> we advocated for a bond referendum and that passed and we got like 1.2 million or something like that. And then we formed a, uh, a group that worked with the city and I purposefully stayed out of that. I was president of the park at that time. So I could go to any meeting, which I was doing all the time, uh, talking about this stuff and say, I don't know where the park will be, but we're doing a park. Uh, and I think you both were on the group yeah. that that um, with John Blanton with the city. Yeah, and, and, good and folks. put together uh, put together uh, the park, and it was. So can I insert yeah, something yeah. about that? So when we uh, got the bond mon bond money to buy the park, I thought, oh good, we're on. Yeah. Now we can have a park. <laughs> well, it's not. That's not how it works. Actually. <laughs> and so, so the city had the money, but they. First of all, they set their priorities for how the money would be spent, and initially we were way at the end of the priorities, but we uh, managed to get moved up. But the other thing was that the city doesn't, um, they don't have a good process for figuring out how to spend money. You know, everybody's busy in the city kind of doing their day-to-day -day things. And it wasn't that the city was just going to go out and buy this property by themselves. So I don't know how John got assigned to this thing, but John Blanton was a city guy who, uh, when we said we were really serious about buying this land and we wanted to do it now, he met with us every week for a year. And we, every week we got an update on properties that might be available. You know, there were some, uh, some pieces of property that had been in estates and the owners didn't even know who they were. 
Uh, I think there was some little triangle that was owned by 17 different people. Uh, and we had to get consent from all of those people to actually buy the property. Dan, I'm sure, remembers this uh, better than me. But something I was struck by was it wasn't just, it didn't happen automatically. And we didn't know what the, what the, what the park was going to be until we could figure out what, the, what parcels of land that were contiguous we could put together. So it was kind of this ongoing discussion about, do we want to buy that piece or this piece, which is going to work best for, for being a park? Uh, Dan, you may want to add something to that. Well, you, you, you jog my memory now in, in a couple couple ways. One, we, we were successful in getting out of the 1996 bond referendum, but as, as Alan said, as they started prioritizing the projects, we weren't going to happen until like 2003 or something like that. But as, as fortuitously happened, um, we got together and quickly identified what we thought were the properties that we should have. And the city projects were not ready, and not ready, and not ready, and not ready. And lo and behold, by mid '97, we were able to go start acquiring the property and properties. And and people ask us, how did you determine the shape of the park? Well, it was determined by really what we could buy for 1.2 million dollars before the money ran out. I mean, and so that's what you see today. And 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 we we worked around that. I will also put in a plug. Um, Somebody who was also very involved in our uh, weekly meetings and committee was uh, Durham Parks and Rec, Gio Rodriguez at the time, yes. remember that? So we, yes. we got together every week and figured out how this land was going to go together. And who paid for those donuts, Dad? Yeah. <laughs> was that you or was that John? And whoever, whoever needed to that day. Yeah, that's, that's, right. the, that's the way it worked out. So, so volunteers researched all the homeowners? The landowner? Uh, actually, John Blanton with the city did that. Yeah, he was, because that had been his job with the city real estate department. He, he knew how to talk to people and negotiate. And, and actually, what a very good story. Uh, one of the families who uh, had inherited some small pieces of property in the park were the Wisentons. And uh, we had to contact them because they were up in Washington, D.C. He was with the Library of Congress at the time. And Vera Wisenton is now on our board. Yeah. So 15 years after we acquired the property, they moved back to Dur Durham and they were there. So we were all excited. We had property, but we had property. And what did it look like? It looked like what Leanne described. It was asphalt parking lots and uh, a transmission shop that was literally falling into the creek and uh, our favorite, her, uh, uh, Leanne's favorite place to eat, the Doghouse Restaurant on, on Foster Street. And what did we do next? How did we actually start turning that into a park? Yeah. I do know. Um, <laughs> and, Tell us. And, and we, we, there was significant conflict with Park and Rec over, over this one thing. But the mayor was, uh, and I'm blocking on his name, Nick. Uh, Nick. Nick, Nick, Nick Denson. And with Nick's approval and his kind of, uh, we, we really had good relationship with the city council so that so i'm sorry we had a really good relationship with the city council and and uh, and so we kind of were able to blow by parks and rec they wanted to use that they wanted to use the that tire store as storage and i was convinced that until we clear land we don't have a park mm -hmm. i mean we own the land but we don't have a park unless until we clear it and so Somebody donated the use of a giant backhoe, and Nick right. drove the backhoe and tore down that tower. <laughs> that was so cool. <laughs> and since and it was the mayor, nobody was going to stop. It. Exactly right. And then the doghouse, they picked it up and they moved that building someplace else. <laughs> and, and 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 then after that, the the a really wonderful thing happened, which was the Grace Garden. And yeah. Leanne, do you remember the Grace Garden? Were you a part of that? I will. I'll, well, just being from Durham and shopping at um, Wellspring, yes. you know, we knew Grace was uh, associated with that gr grocery. And um, so after she passed in that tragic accident, it was um, a group wanted to do something for her and they were looking for a place to do it. And so that was the first garden in our park. <laughs> That was put it put it on the map. Exactly, mm -hmm. and, and, and Kurt can tell us a little bit about the, the the how that happened and how we were approached and some of the nice muddy work days we had and then the really fun work day at the end where we finished that up. We've got it, pictures to prove it. It, it was this this was was quite. I mean, Grace's had so many friends. She was the calligraphy artist at the Wellspring, and they still use her calligraphy. It's just striking. Um, 
and her friends and family and uh, from all over the country um, raised money and um, and Dan, I think you designed the park. We Gio did an earlier version, and then you did that figure eight design and the steps going up, and and um, and we got huge rocks. And Joel Costu and Dan and I were out there with a backhoe. I'm driving the backhoe, which which ought to scare the people at the swinging end. Um, and and. Uh, it starts to rain, and we're Joel cost you, and you are in the mud Literally. as we're putting the. So when you go to the Grace Garden, there's these gigantic rocks that the three of us set. That was terribly fun, and <laughs> Trudy, Trudy had the idea of Trudy Burdett. Trudy Burdett had the idea of making this old, old stuff look like uh, foundations from old houses, because up the hill there are old foundations. So Dan designed retaining walls that really give the appearance of being an old foundation until you realize, well, wait, it looks like the house was there, but that there's a hill there. You can't have a house there. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> yeah, well, you know. But um, so we have this foundation-looking retaining wall system, and and then people, we had a work day, and you organized this, if I remember right. hundred people. And hundreds of her friends, you know, friends, and, and uh, the guy on the made all those rocks that said grace on it. Mitch Fisher. Mitch Fisher made the rocks. And, and, uh, and then um, uh, people came together, and there was nothing, and there were no plants in the ground. And we worked like crazy for like five hours, it seemed to me. And at the end, everybody got a rock in the garden. Existed. And it was done. So I want to say something about how visions become reality. And one of the important things that this reminds me is that a lot of our board members have come to us after digging in the dirt. <laughs> and, there's something, and there's something about a nonprofit organization that gives you something very concrete to do that is a great way to build uh, a sense of purpose. And I remember uh, Sue Watson, who was our uh, board chairman and a very active member of, of the park, she said she first learned about Durham Central Park on a volunteer day, working, you know, digging, pulling weeds. And I think that that's an important part of, of why this group of people has been so energized in creating it. It's not just been an abstraction, it's been very concrete, get the dirt under your fingernails sort of thing, and very satisfied because of that. And I will say that um, the Grace Garden was really the first big spark, as Alan said, that brought these these people together and got them excited. It really it really swelled our numbers, I think, to a very large extent. We spent the next year or two doing similar smaller scale projects up on the the hillside, and um, I think one of the one of the good shout outs we need to give is that around. Uh, 2000, uh, right after that, about 2002 or so, that's when we were able to get a, a local grading contractor to uh, spend all of his volunteer time and equipment rental and gasoline and that sort of thing and, and clean off finally that east side of the park where what we call the, the Great Lawn is today, where the skateboard part. That was uh, Mitch Barron, who is still, uh, still around. Uh, tens of thousands of dollars worth of time that he donated, uh, I think with a little nudging from the, from the mayor and some, some other folks at the time. But, um, you know, sort of a parallel organization that sprang up similar in time to Durham Central Park and was trying to find its way in its home was the, the farmer's market. And the farmer's market had, had sort of been orphans, if you remember, back in the early day when they first started meeting in the nasty gravel parking lot over at the DBAP. And before that, they used to be a little orange street mall. Yes. 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 A little yeah. bit of the Absolutely. So they've always been in the neighborhood, but they were always orphans. Right. Because every time the city would schedule an event for a Saturday morning at the DAP, the farmer's market got kicked out. And so there was some, some inconsistency there. And then um, you probably all remember, uh, you know, 2002, 2003, 2004, uh, Hank Sherrick, who owns Measurement Inc., was gracious enough to let them start setting up in that parking lot, which was great that they had a space, but boy, it got hot there in the summer. So, so 
do you guys remember when it sort of came together and it snapped in our head that maybe we didn't need a big performance space at Central Park, we needed something else? So there was a committee within the Durham Central Park called the Design Committee. And that's a very highfalutin name for a bunch of people who wander around looking at the park saying, what can we put there? And then how can we get it done? And we had several meetings talking about building an amphitheater in the park where there could be small performances and and we met again and again standing and looking at this space and finally one day we said what about if we put the farmers market here in Durham Central Park and everybody said duh <laughs> Well, then we need Ellen Castley here, really, yeah, to, yeah. to, to uh, the architect. And I was involved because my husband was on the board at that point, and he's in the construction industry. And so there was a, a lot of designing and working with the city and what we, you know, just how much we could do at a time and getting bid, competitive bids. And, um, and one of my favorite memories is when Ellen had these tall bamboo rods that were the height yes. of the pavilion, yes. and we marched around <laughs> and stood there, you know, to be where the corners were going to be of this yeah, space that, that didn't, it was just a dream. <laughs> and um, so that was in 2006, I guess, and then in the spring of 2007, that opened up, and, and uh, it was just, it's just a shed with a concrete slab, and um, we had no idea then that, um, we have got, now we've got weddings booked, you know, a year in advance for the pavilion. We have got, when we're doing meals in the market, and so there are a few that we'd like to have at our own space, and we have to, I have to make sure in Jan January that we reserve those fall events in January, because this space now, we have this great re revenue stream from the rentals of people that want to do things down there. Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead, Kurt. <laughs> um, and I want to, uh, this is, in this same time frame, there was a maturing of the organization, which I think is important. Um, because in the, in the beginning, it was um, we, we we didn't have a budget. We did you know all we we incorporated so we could be a five hundred one c three. But the the uh, the ventures uh, fund of um, self help funnel served as a uh, pass through, so people could get tax deductions and and. and uh, a major maturing of the organization happened when we got a Robert Wood Johnson grant. Uh, a lot of money, like two hundred and fifty thousand dollars or something, for for three years and and to promote exercise. And so we changed the street signs and we had all kinds of programs going on in the park. Uh, African American Dance Ensemble taught classes, and there'd be fifty people out there dancing, you know, and and on and on uh, bike bike uh, things, but. But one of the outcomes that I, I'm sorry, one of the outcomes of that um, Robert Wood Johnson grant was they wanted reports. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they wanted accountability? Yeah, yeah. Which, which was something of a problem for me. Because, <laughs> you know, prior to that, with no budget, I mean, literally, if we were going to do something, we would just sort of throw money in the hat. You knew we needed $1,000 to do something. You know, 10 of us would throw money in the hat, and we'd do it. Um, and and we barely kept records. The the 501c3 didn't make us file income tax because we didn't have more than twenty five thousand dollars a year. But like six years later, the IRS turned around and said, "Well, what have you done? You know, show us your budget. Show us how you spent my money. How much? You know." And it was like it, it was pretty hard to do that. And about that same time, we were getting big enough. We needed uh, an employee. Um, and so these two things came together and we shifted into being a real nonprofit kind of organization. Um, and there was this gratifying new wave of leadership that, that came in. We, we had had a steering committee that was kind of a dozen of us or so, but, but um, uh, Frank DePasco uh, took over as president. He's gone now, I think. He may be the only one who was there at the beginning who's who's not with us anymore. But but Frank took over as president. We had an executive director. We we functioned more as a, a typical nonprofit. And that leadership just never looked back. It went, onward, upward. I, I think
think that also leads to another, um, you know, bit of business as we had to mature, and that was that, you know, for the first couple of years of us actually digging in the dirt, literally, uh, we had no formal relationship with the city other than they said, okay, you guys figured out where the park is and go out there and putter around and let us know what you're doing and that's probably okay. But when it actually came to the pavilion, which is a real thing, I mean, it's, it's permanent and you need insurance and you need to maintain it and it takes money and there's income and that sort of thing, uh, then you know, we in the city kind of said, time out for a minute, we probably need to have some kind of formalized agreement on what we're going to do. So that led to our very first, uh, I guess, memorandum of understanding, and maybe Kurt or Alan, you can, you can expound on that a little bit more, uh, on, on what first started out on the west side of the park, and I think now, over the last year or two, we've transferred to the entire piece of park property where Durham Central Park is actually responsible. But we've got a, a wonderful relationship with the city. I mean, we couldn't have done this without the city. As much um, fundraising and effort uh, that we've gotten from, from, from the board and volunteers and our, our members of Central Park um, and, and various grants from the state and the feds and that sort of thing over the years, the, the city's been a big contributor as well to the, to the park. You, one, of you, one of you want to talk about that just a little bit? I think we've done Okay, all right. Well, I, I stole their thunder. Sorry. Could you talk about raising money for the pavilion, though? Because yeah, how did that get financed? Yeah. So, so we, um, we started out uh, trying to fundraise privately for the pavilion. In fact, I remember some meetings where we actually brought in a professional fundraising firm and talked about what services they could provide and, and how we might do this, that, and the other thing. But but nothing actually ever felt quite right like we can pull it together. But a wonderful match was made when we talked to our friends at Self Help and they assigned Malcolm White to us. And I don't know if any of you know Mal White or not, but he said, yeah, we can make this happen. So he set out a plan for uh, uh, breaking out some state funding and federal funding and corporate grants and private fundraising, et cetera, et cetera. And I think we got a hundred thousand dollars from uh, from the the federal government David through, through David Price's office. Um, we were able to get some fairly large corporate grants. The largest was actually uh, a fifty thousand dollar grant from Strever Brothers Eccleston Rouse. You may remember they did phase two of American. <laughs> yes, yes. I will. If anybody disparages them, I will always come to their defense because of because of that. We we had a uh, a pillar program where people could uh, sponsor one of the columns in the pavilion. So. That happened. I think we got a county open space grant. So that actually built the the pavilion and the concrete and the sidewalks and the curbing and all that sort of thing. The landscaping, of course, was all done by volunteers because that's the way we do things. And if you go to our website, you'll see that. But then an interesting thing happened. Um, so we got that built and we were all excited and, and we were ready to move into that pavilion. And <coughs> And we thought we would just be able to get away with using porta johns like they do over in Carver. <laughs> and the city inspections department said, no, you've built a real building. You need real bathrooms. So we went to the city and we worked through the manager's office and they were able to identify, I think ironically, $300,000 in unspent money from the 1996 bond fund where our original funding came. And it wasn't our money, it was for another city project. And they earmarked that to build the restrooms and the storage facility that we have. And, and folks, I'll tell you, just the restroom portion cost as much as all of the rest of the pavilion put together. But ultimately we got it done. And again, that is the partnership with the city. They were able to come forward and make it happen and because of that, today, we had that great opening ceremony in 2007. Is that when the pavilion opened? Yes. Bro. When all the cars came in and there was snow on top of them, it was cold, and it was an early spring. But it was great. And, it, and, it's, and it's, as we all know, it's, it's gotten better um, ever since then. Who owns it? Who owns the, the pavilion now? The pavilion itself is owned by Durham Central Park. They lease the ground that it sits on. 
the so Durham Central Park is solely responsible for maintaining the pavilion. We carry the insurance, we clean it, we pay the utility bills. Uh, if somebody breaks the glass in the bathrooms, which has happened, if somebody breaks into the door, that sort of thing, we're responsible for that. But um, Durham Central Park does that. So uh, just to let you know that anytime you contribute in any way to Durham Central Park, whether it's going to a food truck rodeo or attending a, a Meals from the Market event or uh, making a contribution in some way or another, even buying something at the farmer's market because the farmers pay rent uh, to rent the pavilion, that all goes toward operating the, the, the market pavilion and our other structures uh, within the park. And we're not done yet. And, and Leanne, I wanted to... Uh, well, ahead. I was just going to say, the, a couple of years ago, the, um, they needed a place for the uh, Blues Festival. Yes. And it came to the park free. So, of course, it was very well attended. And we hosted that. And I like to say that Durham Central Park, I mean, we're a nonprofit. We depend on volunteer dollars. We powered the uh, Blues Festival that year. Yeah. <laughs> we did. We paid for the electricity. Mm -hmm. And the 4th of July, remember when the 4th of uh, July? The yeah. city brought it the 4th of July one year, and that was the first year that I saw the lawn going up toward where the police station is now. That's the first time I saw people covering that lawn and kind of got an idea of, and now we see that all the time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so sustainability has always been important to us. Obviously, in the, in the early years, we we were lucky to, well, first we didn't have an employee, so it wasn't an issue. We passed the hat, as Kurt said. Then we had an employee, and, you know, the first eight or ten years of our existence, it was always, okay, where's, where's the money going to come from for our executive director's next paycheck? But, you know, over the last four or five years, we have gotten to be fairly financially sustainable yeah, because it. of some of the big things mm -hmm. we've done. And, and Leanne, one of those big things has been the, the meals from the market. And you've been very involved in that over the years. Can you tell us a little mm -hmm. bit about how that works? Right, and of course I'm not responsible for it. I just picked it up and ran with it. It was uh, someone else's idea and someone else had started it. But uh, at that time we needed some source of income. That was before people started renting the pavilion. And we, I mean, now we have people to all those nonprofits on the side, we, that's an income stream for us too. They pay $25 every time they put a table up. Anyway, so we needed a source of income and um, it was one of the Duke uh, students that came and interned one summer, had the idea of, since we're bringing in the farmers and we're, you know, we're focusing on the you know, farmer's market, let's have food from the market that, and then have volunteers ha host meals and then they would allow them to tickets to be sold to the public and then um, everything would be donated by those uh, coast who hosted different meals and um, and it just it is it has taken off and you know of course when I first started doing it things were blowing and going before 2008 <laughs> and, then, and uh, we had all, uh, and then when and things got lean I thought oh no you know what are we going to do now no people you know we had no corporate donors and how are we going to do it but we had a steady uh, stream of hosts that were willing to invite 10, 15 people into their home, cook a meal and charge them $50 or whatever and make a little chunk of money and uh, that pretty much financed our administrative director for several years there now and uh, before we have other streams that we have now. So uh, anyway, it's all volunteer driven and it's, and it's been perfect for us because it's allowed us to um, introduce people to the park. Um, one other thing I wanted to say is the, when uh, Lee Scott was a director, um, her main focus was trying to tell people in Durham where the park was. Right. <laughs> That's, you know, everything that we did was how can we get people down here so that they'll know that there's a park here. And we even went over to, uh, I had children at the Durham Magnet School, Old Durham High, Durham Magnet School, now Durham School of the Arts, and there were parents that had children there that didn't know where Durham Central Park was. And we, um, so that was, that's so ironic that the focus has completely changed now. It absolutely has, <clears throat> and, 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 and a side note with that is now we are seeing so many other around the park organizations adopting the name Durham Central Park or Central Park or, or whatever, which is actually very gratifying that people are now recognizing that there's there's a place there, that the park started a place and that place is becoming. Um, Alan, we're not quite done with the park yet, are we? <laughs> what are what do we have planned for the for the next These couple the of years? Still. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the well, we still have stars in our eyes about <laughs> what can happen in the park. 
Um, and of course, things are changing around the park all the time too. So, uh, on the we, we have a master plan for the park, and one part of the master plan that's high on our agenda is uh, an area for kids. Uh, there's a lot of cool things for teenagers, the skate park, and adults, and the farmers market, and picnic tables. But we really would like to have uh, a, a draw for little kids. And right now there are a few pieces of sculpture that you can you see kids climbing on. Uh, but we have something uh, planned called Wonderland. Wonderland. Wonder. Wonderland. And uh, we hope that you'll be seeing that taking form over the next uh, few years. We have, uh, the first thing is going to be a, hopefully a, an artificial hill that we're going to create for kids to climb up and down across the street from the farmer's market. And, uh, and then more uh, landscaping and grading and, uh, and walkways and benches. And, and then there's always the serendipity of something like the leaf popping up that we don't expect, uh, which was kind of a, uh, you know, this fantastic gift from uh, a combination of people on our board and students at NC State uh, putting together. Uh, I'm, our time is going to run out here before we know it, and one thing I have to say before the time runs out is that for every name that you have heard mentioned here, there are five or ten other people who have put their heart and, uh, and, and efforts into this and have been part of this fantastic network of people who have um, made the park what it is, and, and including you know the current board members and young people who come in who are going to be the next generation of working on this park, which of course is more than a park. You know, the vision of this is that it's a place for this community to come together, that it's a community building place. And so it's not only the things that we're going to build, which we're excited about, but the things that happen there. And I think the farmer's market is, is a great kind of metaphor for that. When, uh, when this community comes together in a, in, in a really happy kind of celebratory way just over food that's locally grown. And we would love to see lots of other things like that happen in the park. And we would like to see more parts of our community feel ownership for this park. I mean, clearly there's the neighborhoods around there and a certain portion of this community already has discovered it, but there's still other people who we're looking to draw in. So um, that that's also part of our vision, not just building it, but uh, having it serve this purpose of, of really being a, 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 a back porch or the backyard for our community. Absolutely. Well put. We started out building a thing and we realized what we really needed to build and have been successful at is building a place. And a place is only really, a, can be measured as a place if people come there. And they do. And we want more people to come there. So it might be a good time, Alice, if uh, for us to maybe uh, entertain any questions. Obviously, we could go on for hours about things that we gush over. Uh, and, and, we'll, and will if you let us. Yeah, we're but, pleased uh, everybody's still here. Yes. <laughs> Please, any any questions from the audience? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I'm a, a neighbor of Grace Richardson back when, and a former artist at Wellspring, and uh, one of you came and gave a talk at some meeting of. Friends of Grace, and I wrote a check. I wrote a check at that time for the Grace Garden. I was out of town when the work was going on, however. But I wanted to say that last November, my sister came to visit from Tucson, Arizona, and she's one of those people at a place called the Drachman Institute, which is affiliated with the planning program at the University of Arizona. And she's one of those people who provides impetus and plans and brainstorming and grant getting for exactly these kinds of developments. And she loved the entire Central Park and took lots of pictures. And so I'm wondering, is this wonderful story, which I didn't write down very well, is it available online? Because I think that would be a wonderful thing for her to get a hold of, to go with the photos that she's gonna to show to various people out there. And just for your edification, you're becoming well known in Southern Arizona. <laughs> Good to know. Well, it, it, as a timeline and a storyline in its entirety, no, it's not available online, uh, but it probably needs to be. 
as as you know we were Leanne and I were, were speaking this morning we were over at the park selling t-shirts and just chatting up and the things that we do that um, a lot of our younger board members and, and it's gratifying that we now have younger board members not just a bunch of folks who are getting a little bit gray uh, who, who are stepping up and have just as much passion as we've had to keep this park going but but they probably don't know the entirety of this story and it would be good for that story to be documented in one way or another. By the way, uh, Emily is, is here today, Emily Ledoux. She is uh, uh, working on a, on, a, on a project, and uh, maybe at some point she will make her, uh, her storyline available to us to put on the website as well. Tell them about the website. Oh, and, and we do have a recently uh, updated website. There's a lot of interactive information on there. Most importantly is uh, events going on in the park, things going on. Uh, DurhamCentralPark.org, easy to remember, just write that down. But that's a fantastic suggestion that, that we do uh, work on one of, one of because we have board members interested in doing that kind of stuff. And they know how to do that kind of stuff. I don't know how to do that kind of stuff. I will also add, and I greatly appreciate your comment, and I'll, I'll, if Kurt's going to have say, something to say here in a moment too, I think. Uh, the, the Grace Garden Fund is sustainable. There is money coming into that every year. Um, years ago, Central Park volunteers were taking care of that garden, but it got to the point where we, we realized that it was such a great um, uh, asset to the community mm -hmm. and the park that it maybe needed a little more TLC than we can offer. So we actually now have a professional landscape firm who comes in quite often uh, with the Grace Fund continuing to pay for that. Uh, to keep that looking good. And it's it's the place where I take everybody in the park if we only have a little bit of time to look. Dan, right. talk about volunteer work days. Yeah, the volunteer. <laughs> okay. And the variety of volunteers. Yeah. So, um, it, it, just from, from day one, back in 1999, when we first started pulling weeds out of the east side of the park and discovered that there were tents pitched over there because the, the mimosa trees and the weeds were so tall. We realized that the only way we could keep the park looking good uh, and safe and for it to be a place where people wanted to come, that we needed people to be able to step up, be willing to step up and do that. And, and for the last 13 or 14 years now, we've been able to not only sustain a, um, a steady group of adults and children and, and people in between who are willing to come out for three hours on a Saturday morning and risk poison ivy and get dirt under their fingernails and, 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 and get things done. But that cadre has actually grown over the years. So we've had some very steady eddy groups that have helped us over the years. Uh, one of the biggest has been the youth group at Immaculate Conception Church, who's been coming for at least 12 years now. Uh, we finally wised up this year and dedicated a table to, to them because of all the work they've done. Um, Duke University does not sing its own praises, but I will sing Duke's praises for it because we have so many students, um, grad students, and even uh, kids in their, their TIP program and some of their summer groups uh, want to come and work in the park uh, to keep it looking good. And that's what it takes. That's why Central Park is, I think, the best looking park in Durham. That's because the city does what it can, which is mow the grass, empty the trash cans, sweep the streets, things of that nature, and we are grateful, very grateful that they can do that. But to maintain that higher level of the flowers and the plantings and the mulching and that sort of thing, we need hundreds of volunteer hours a year. And we are getting those volunteer hours. But I will put out the appeal that if anybody is interested in helping us on a future workday, we have regular workdays the first Saturday in March, no, uh, April, May, and June and then September, October, and November, first Saturday of the month, uh, of Saturday of the month of those months. We also have special work days over the year. And if anybody can get three people together and wants to do a special work day, give me a call. I'll meet you out there. We've got something for you to do. Uh, DurhamCentralPark.org is the website. Go there. But that's what makes the park look good. Are the goats going to come back? <laughs> uh, we are negotiating for the goats to potentially come back later this year. Yes. Yes, ma'am. I mean, I dare, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. I wanted to know whose idea was the skate park? Mm -hmm. 
think it was Parks and Rec, wasn't it? Yeah. That was Parks. I think it was Parks and Rec. That was Parks. Is that uh, Parks and Rec, or is it's, but it's part of the Central Park? That's right, and, and there, was, um, there was considerable discussion about where it goes. There was some trepidation uh, on our part about yeah, what had changed the tone, um, and the fact that it went in on the same, it kind of triangulates with the Senior Citizens Center, which is kind of cool, <laughs> and the police station right across the street, and, and, and that ends up being a nice triangle. Um, uh, plus, the, and you probably understand this more, there was a, there's an insurance deal to that, where the, the state somehow indemnifies a, a skate park so that you can have it, and the inevitable injuries that happen, we're not responsible. For. That's correct. So, but I think a, a crucial thing was when Parks and Rec wanted to build the park, build the skate park, they weren't necessarily thinking of something that exists today. Right. They had an, an idea of something would have a chain link fence about it. Right. Ugly. Okay. And somebody from our board, we managed to get onto the uh, committee at the Parks and Rec that would decide the uh, design and contract for that. And Peter Hausman spent a lot of time as a volu citizen volunteer with the Parks and Rec, Rec, and he came back to us and said, guys, it's going to be okay. We're going to have a design we're going to be happy with. And in fact, you know, we love having the skate park there, but it wasn't an autumn, it wasn't a no-brainer. We were quite concerned that we might get something that would be more headache than uh, entertainment, but of course it's, it's turned out to be uh, mostly good. <laughs> I'm just very impressed with you know all the hard work that you all have put into this, and I'm very appreciative that we have this in Durham right now, and certainly grown from a grassroots to a major organization. And I was curious, as this has evolved, I know you're incorporated, but how is the day-to-day -day business of the organization managed? Is it more than an executive director, and do you have an office, and who oversees you know scheduling and all of that? Leanne, you're on the executive committee. Go ahead. Um, oh. yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, we still work with one part-time administrative director, but the way we can do that is because our board members are so active. I mean, they take on, I mean, their, their job, it's almost like they have second jobs being on the board of Durham Central Park, and that's how we've done that. And um, so... Even keeping track of finances and taxes or whatever, all of that? Is right, that right. So, yeah, we have, you know, just we have an executive committee that meets, you know, regularly once a month. And a then treasurer. A, and a treasurer who's on it. And, a, you know, so we're keeping up with all of that. And then we have a, a board that meets, every, we've been meeting every other month for years. And this past year, y'all are on the board now, we actually had board members that wanted to meet more than once a month. More, they wanted to meet, meet not every other month, but every month. And so it was like, oh, okay. <laughs> you also have a great executive director. And we have a great executive director, Ann Alexander. Okay. And uh, she's an excellent multitasker and, and uh, delegator. And, and there's an uh, office. There's and a, she has found, you know, found a nice little office space that we sublease from someone who's in the Durham City Park area. And as we keep our expenses down, and watch every penny because we work hard for those pennies. We, we keep now, up. Are you it. all connected with the Durham Hub? The history, history museum? Yeah. Um, or no? There's, there's a lot of history here. We, too. we are indirectly connected in in, in this way. Um, uh, one of the members of the Durham Hub, Steve Channing, if you know Steve, he um, has this great idea of creating this series of history groves around Durham. Uh, each one dedicated to a, a different individual and each one telling a story and his goal is that eventually you can take a walking tour around down, downtown Durham, go to these history hubs, learn a little bit about that. Well, the very first one is in Central Park. Uh, so he, we were able to uh, coordinate what he wanted to do with a couple of Eagle Scout projects and find a little corner near the Grace Garden where there is now a um, uh, a history grove. I think this one is dedicated to John Hope Franklin, if I if I recall, and it's uh, right over by the red picnic table near the Grace Garden. So if you go over there, you'll find it. So uh, we are indirectly connected to the hub. Leanne, can I? Yeah. Let me just add also that Durham Central Park is actually a partner with many nonprofits, and when we can uh, do something to raise money for another nonprofit or share our profits from something we do. 
And so we work closely with seeds, uh, the with, the, with, the, with the farmer's market, with the art community around us. And so we're always looking for ways to partner and benefit all of us in the process. Excellent point. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, hi. Uh, can you hear this at all? Yes. Yeah, um, yeah um, I had a question, uh, and uh, I've uh, been a volunteer uh, with Leanne at some of the events raising money for Durham Central Park in the past, along with my partner Dan, um, such as the Cast Beer events and things in the Trotter Building. Um, very exciting to hear about the history of the park because I'm a new resident to Durham, and I'm also a new member of the Durham Open Spaces and Trails Commission, oh, yeah. okay. and uh, I was aware that you were a recipient in 2004 of funds from the matching grant program that they do, which is a wonderful, wonderful program. And I just wanted to know a little bit of background, if you had anything to say about that program and your experience with it. Right. 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 Especially considering the kind of... No, it, 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 it's an excellent program. Um, I'll put in my plug, it needs to continue because it, it, it funds you know, lots of relatively small but meaningfully important projects throughout Durham. In our case, we were able to take the, one of the open space grants and that's how we were able to build the nature trail system on the side of the park connecting the Grace Garden over behind the Market Pavilion. If you've ever been in the, the trails and our Butterfly Garden and the Prudential Garden, all of the, the 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 gravel screenings and the and the equipment rental and the edging that was put in and even some of the original plantings were done as as part of that that uh, that open space grant. So that's been excellent. We also received a, a 319 grant from the state about six or seven years ago that we were able to use with the city's help to. Um, do a, a restoration project in the creek that runs under the bridge. So if you've, if you've ever stood on the bridge and looked down and seen the, the little waterfalls and the boulders and there's a rain garden that was so overgrown, but last fall we were able to clean it up so you can see it again. That was done with some state money. But all of those grants are critically important because each one in itself may not be a game changer, but over the course of several years and several of those grants, you can build a park, and that's what we did. Mm -hmm. And I <laughs> wanted to make the point that, you know, there's a, a critical vote coming up on Monday for the current recipients from that program. So if it's something that people feel strongly about, it's worth making your voice heard before yeah. Monday. Good comment. Um, I, I wanted to add that the trail itself, in the design of the park, we called the trail the spine of the park. <laughs> and as it winds across that first bridge and the, the big sweeping curve and then crosses Foster, and works its way out. Um, that there's hope that it will cross through the Grace Garden, and then it will form another bridge, uh, a suspension bridge, <laughs> um, uh, cross back over to uh, uh, the dam. Yes. And Kurt's already designed that suspension bridge. Right. <laughs> I really want a suspension. Bridge. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, well, I just wanted to put in a little plug uh, when you were mentioning about working with all the nonprofits, I play in the Durham Community Concert Band and we are giving a concert next Saturday, week from today, at the Pavilion. Thank it's you. free Fantastic. of charge, all our concerts are free, and uh, this will be our second concert there, and the people who have come to the concert love having it there. Um, it's at 5 o'clock, the Durham Jazz Band is going to play, and then after that, the Durham Community Concert Band. And, we, par and we partner with Habitat for Humanity at our concert, so. And, and do you know the program? What, is, what, what will you be playing? It's going to be, uh, our part's going to be a lot of light music. This is one of our family-friendly kids come and dance around and mm -hmm. parade around and stuff. So a lot of, you know, music from Les Mis, Phantom, Annie, um, Carousel, some marches. Um, our director, Tom Schaefer, always likes to get kids and anybody who wants to come and direct, so we have to play something that we can just play ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> and those, those, are, those, those are exactly the kind of things, and we're, we're so glad you did, did that, and I went to the last one. Those are exactly the kind of things that we, we, we are trying to make sure that the park can accommodate, because the, the pavilion, when we designed the pavilion, it wasn't just to hold the farmer's market. We thought about how could you have a small concert over here or a larger concert over there, and I think you remember from the last time you were there, it was such a hot day 
uh, that it's nice to be able to set up in the shade right. on a hot day or even if it's raining and, and be out of the weather. So uh, we want to make every part of the park as multi-purpose as possible. So thank you for being It was a there. great venue, but bring chairs because there aren't a lot for audience. Yes. Right, right. Bring chairs. A couple benches. Yeah. Quick question, is there a map of the park? Yes, there's a there's a map online on our website, again, DurhamCentralPark.org. It'll show you what's built to date. I think there may be a master plan on there as well that shows you what, as Alan said, some of our uh, our big ideas are for the future. And is that where you go if you want to rent a pavilion for something or rent, hold an event in the park? Do you go to that online? And go to that website. There is a place to uh, click to rent a pavilion or you can e there's an email link to uh, info at DurhamCentralPark.org. That'll get you to Ann, our executive yeah. director. And while we're speaking of other events, let's talk a little bit about Durham Central Park's own events. Uh, most of you are from very familiar with the food truck rodeos. Mm -hmm. Those are produced, uh, organized and produced by Durham Central Park. And we have two great events coming up very shortly. One next weekend, which is uh, Bull City Chili Challenge, and it is the only yeah. sanctioned chili challenge in the Triangle. And no, it's great. I mean, you will know. Well, you probably already do. But uh, it's it's a great event. Come out. Uh, it's it starts at twelve o'clock next Saturday, and then on Fourth of July we always have our children's. Fourth of July parade. Mm -hmm. The kids come out. They decorate decorate their bikes. We blow up more balloons than we care to. And, um, but it's a great time. The the fire department comes out and opens the hose, and the kids just love it, and the adults uh, do as well. And then this summer we'll also have our Warehouse Blue series, which will start uh, in July on Friday night. So check our website for that as well. Leanne, do we have anything else? I think oh, I'm sure you were missing something. <laughs> there, I know, I but uh, but we keep that. You know, luckily there is a website where you can just you know pop things and keep them up to date because there's just so much so much going on. And, and I do be, I do believe we have the next food truck rodeo a week from Sunday. Father's right. Day. Yeah, that's on Sunday. Sunday. Is the man with the movies coming back? Yeah, the man with the movies he's is already started. Awesome. Awesome. He's got one yeah. more to go. Yeah, yeah. Friday. Yeah, yeah. What, third what, Friday. What she's right. talking about is uh, Tom Whiteside mm -hmm. uh, with Durham Cinematique. He actually started showing movies um, next to, uh, it was Joe and Joe's at the time, on, on Chapel Hill Street, but he's been in Durham Central Park now for at least three years, mm -hmm. at least three years. Um, are there additional questions? When, Hello, Alice. When will the uh, meals program start? Well, the meals program, we've got hosts lined up now. And they're planning their menus for this. It'll start at uh, the end of August and uh, go through October. And uh, we will start selling tickets uh, at the end of August. Those are fantastic. Yes. Good, Thank good, you. good. <laughs> Every fan. Is if you Thank haven't you for... been to the farmer's market on Saturday morning, it is the place to be and be seen. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and catch up on everything. That's right. That's right. <laughs> And is there now a hopeful future for the Liberty Warehouse building? Uh, that's another topic. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to say before this program is over, though, that there was a, the wonderful that. collection of, of metal artists that were once there. It's going to be great. And what, Durham Center Park had an office there in the building, and they continue to be real supporters. And we're also partnered with the Liberty Arts uh, group, you know, and share share profits and, and a meal for the market. And they do a meal for the market, a pick pick in every fall and we split the proceeds with them. And, right. And they've got, they've got plans too for putting sculptures in the park. So they're working on that now to, you know, to happen sometime the next year. Well, are there additional questions? A lot going on. Well, first of all, I want to thank the four of you for coming out. <laughs> And Alan, keep walking around in. <laughs> Where are you walking um, It's just an understatement to say that Durham Central Park has truly been a catalyst for that end of downtown. Um, Measurement Inc., a big shout out to everything that they've done on that end. And then I think with the park, uh, you started seeing the businesses, the restaurants pop up. And now, as Leanne was saying earlier, it just never ceases to amaze me to see people walking up and down Rigsby Avenue and Foster Street. It's just 
such a far cry from what wasn't happening uh, 15 years ago. So again, thank you all, thank you for coming out. And if you haven't been to the park lately, please go down and buy a t-shirt. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Have the video oh, thank this, you. We'll put on the YouTube page in a, in a, eventually. <laughs> All right, YouTube page. I'm just kind of running up to say hello and to ask y'all about something before you start.